Let's pray. Father, we have such wonderful, powerful uh, words from you to consider today. And so we ask that you would ready our hearts um, for this journey through, uh, through these words that have been given for our good and for our transformation. Father, we ask that as a result of our time together in this word, that you would give us this heart that we see expressed by John the Baptist in the passage, that we would live to see Jesus increase, Jesus exalted, Jesus made great, Jesus magnified, and that we would seek to decrease. We would seek to fall into the background, to not be in the spotlight, to not be the point, but to be pointers to your son, to give all glory to him. And so we ask that you would do that in our midst, in our hearts today. You would give us a clear vision and understanding of your son, Jesus Christ, and you would transform us as a result of that engagement for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What is the good life? What kind of life leads to happiness and fulfillment? In other words, we could ask, where is true life and true joy to be found? And how can I find it and experience it? These are massive questions that we ask and that everyone we know, uh, they ask, whether consciously or subconsciously. People are looking for a life that's fulfilling and satisfying. And I think there are a number of places we could go to see how uh, people in our culture give various answers to that question. I'm going to give you a weird example this morning, uh, which will probably not surprise any of you that makes sense with where we typically go, and it'll come from the animated film, Sing. So I don't know if anybody's a fan of this. I have a decent amount of exposure to uh, family films with four kids in the house. But Sing was a movie produced in 2016, set in a world where all the characters are animals. And it's about a struggling theater owner, a koala bear named Buster Moon, who hosts the singing competition to prevent foreclosure of his uh, establishment. One of the characters in the movie, though, is a greedy, self-centered little mouse named Mike, who can sing like Sinatra. And so, in a climactic moment of the movie, Mike sings Sinatra, Sinatra's classic song, My Way, which describes this personal journey of self-determination that many of the characters seem to go through in the movie. And I just want to share a few of the lyrics of Sinatra's classic from the beginning and then the end. So maybe this will be familiar to you. He says, and now... The end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I traveled each and every highway. And more, much more than this, I did it my way. And then the last stanza. For what is a man, what has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took my blows. And I would, you know, we're not going to bring the chorus in right now to make you sing it. <laughs> and did it my way, you know. <laughs> yes, it was my way. Now, Sinatra, if you know his story, he later came to resent the song. So this is not a knock on Dear Sinatra or anything like that. You can go listen to his music and know that I in no way was, was knocking him. But how would someone who believed these words in the song answer those questions we mentioned in light of these lyrics? I think it would be something like this, that the full life, the good life, is found in doing it my way, following my heart not kneeling to anyone and being my own ruler. That's what many people believe is going to bring them life and joy. And at the root of this idea is an ancient sin going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And that is the sin of pride. Is that deep down, just like our first parents, we buy the lie that true joy and true life will be found not by submitting to God, and living for his name, but in doing things our way, 
for our own praise and purposes. We were created to find life in giving glory to God, and yet we try to find it in seeking glory for ourselves. And in our passage today, John the Baptist shows us a better way than my way. He shows where life and joy are truly found, not in envying Jesus and wanting what belongs exclusively to God, but in embracing Jesus and living to exalt him. These are John the Baptist's last words in this book, and as the end approaches for him, he's not singing a tune of me, me, me. Everything he's doing is screaming him, him, him. His joy is in Christ's exaltation. And so as we walk through these verses, we're going to identify three ways that John the Baptist's story shows us how we also can experience true life and true joy. So number one, true life, true joy are found by recognizing who is on the throne. The context of the story is given in verses 22 through 26, so let's walk through that. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. Now, if you read, uh, if you look in the next chapter, John 4, 2, it clarifies what's happening, that Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. So what he's really describing is Jesus is, is overseeing this ministry in the Judean countryside that his disciples are doing. Meanwhile, verse 23, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, Because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. (laughs) I love this explanation, right? It's like John's ministry philosophy. Why Why was he baptizing? Well, there was plenty of water plenty of people, and he's not in jail. (laughs) So there you go. There's your, you know, like, what should I do with my life? Well, if you're not in prison, people want to be baptized and follow Jesus, and there's water, you know, uh, there you go. Um, Take it and run with it. But in verses 25 through 26, a problem emerges. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. So this is a debate about ceremonial washing. We're not told the details of the discussion. That's apparently not an important point of the passage, but it somehow leads to John's disciples becoming concerned and asking him a question. Verse 26, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. So first of all, this is an exaggeration on their part, because verse 23, we know people are still coming to John, so not everyone has left the scene. But John's numbers are plummeting. His ratings are going down. And their response is one of resentment, frustration, and even you see some bitterness here. They've been loyally following John. John has been promoting Jesus, and now it's costing him disciples. John the Baptist's congregation is shrinking, and they're not happy about it. So look at John's response in verse 27. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. Would you just take in the weight of that claim from a broad perspective first? So John is appealing to the truth of God's absolute sovereignty, right? God's rule over the universe. And this is a a truth. It's a major theme, major thread throughout the scriptures. Just a few examples. We read it in James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. It must come from him. As Paul writes in Romans 11, 34 through 36, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid as if he's ever received anyone, anything from anyone that he didn't already own. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And then Paul, in 1 Corinthians, he applies this to the work of Christian ministry. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7. There are divisions in the church about which side people are taking. And Paul says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. So Paul, Apollos, John, 
Every one of us, we are all just role players. We are servants whose simple task is to be faithful with what God has given us, with where God has placed us, and to trust that He will give the growth. So now see how John is applying that truth to the specific issue at hand. John's numbers are dwindling while people are being drawn to Jesus. And what he's essentially saying in response is this, whoever has come to me at this point, it is only because God has given them to me. I can't receive a single person for baptism unless God grants it. And now whoever is going to Jesus It is only because God has given him these disciples. All right, this language, you probably are already noting this if you've been going through John's gospel with us. This language of God's giving comes up over and over again. We saw it last week. God gave his only son. And then one other key passage that's coming that's uh, that's, uh, relevant to this statement is in John 6, 37 through 39. This is where Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. So what John's disciples are seeing as a problem is actually the sovereign plan of God unfolding before their very eyes. God is giving believers to the Son, and the Son is going to receive them, save them, keep them, and raise them up on the last day if they believe in Him. And so John sees his role in the story. Look in verse 28. He says, You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before Him. He's been sent ahead of Christ, to prepare people for Christ, and to point people to Christ. And his message has been consistent. I'm not the Christ. I'm not the guy. And he keeps pointing to Jesus saying, this is the Christ. This is the Lamb of God. And so the beauty is that John understands who Jesus is, that he's the king, he's the point. He understands who he is in response, what role he's been given by God, and the beauty is John is totally content with it. What about us? Are you content with whatever role the sovereign king assigns you? Or are we only okay serving him if we get to pick the part? If we get to do it our way? And growing up, uh, my church that I grew up in would often do children's plays and musicals from time to time. And I had a love-hate relationship with this, beginning with hate. I hated when it happened. I didn't want to be a part of it. But at the same time, when it did happen, it's like, if I'm going to have to be here, you know, like, give me the lead role, <laughs> you know? A, if, if someone's going to have to shine, let me go for it, you know? So I remember a few of them, but one that is etched into my memory, my memory the most was a musical about Jonah the prophet. And so this is where my acting career really came to an abrupt halt. Uh, I remember when parts were being handed out for the play, and I assumed that others had an appreciation for my acting skills and my singing skills um, that would be highly valued in this performance. Uh, To my dismay, I was not selected for the part of Jonah. And so you're like, man, you have so much baggage, you even named your kid Jonah, you know? Uh, No, unrelated. Um, I also wasn't selected for any key roles or musical numbers. Instead, I was chosen to be the king of Nineveh. (laughs) He had like two lines, and I had to say them in a goofy voice. Um, The closest parallel is if you know the princess bride, I essentially had to speak like the priest officiating the wedding. Uh, I believe I had to say evil as evil um, and mispronounce many other words. So I did my job, but I was not happy about it. I wanted a more prominent role. I wanted one that mattered more in my mind, and I resented the one that was given to me. And how often do we act in the same way about the station in life that God has given us, about the ministry that God has called us to? Even among those who want to do great things for the kingdom, this prideful mentality can infect it and corrupt it. 
I've had a hand in discipling uh, a few guys over the years, and what's been really heartbreaking to see at times is people who are on fire for the Lord and who are ready to change the world on the grandest stage for Jesus. But then there would be along the way little hints of arrogance or pride, which we struggle with, right? Right? People would see themselves as uniquely, exclusively called for a certain grand role with huge numbers and influence. You'd hear things where they would essentially say things like they felt essential, indispensable to God's kingdom advancement. That they were okay serving in this current small situation for a while, but they knew God had called them to a bigger, more influential ministry. And the the tough part was when those plans didn't materialize for those friends, they became disillusioned, discouraged, and even sometimes became bitter with God or bitter with God's people because they had been viewing ministry as a vehicle to their own name, and now that it wasn't happening, it had become an obstacle to the path of their own recognition. And friends, if anyone could understandably feel those types of things, to feel essential, to feel built for greatness and a bigger, bigger platform, it'd be John the Baptist. <laughs> He's got a huge following. People are going to him for baptism, but he does not go to this place of pride. In his mind, his ministry has served his purpose, its purpose, and he's okay to see it diminish. He's not the Christ. He's not the point. He's just a pointer. And so again, what about us? Do you understand, this is a key thing, that you aren't the Christ? (laughs) That meaning you aren't the center of attention. The throne belongs exclusively to Jesus. And are you content if the role that God has assigned you is different than the one you envisioned for yourself? What if he has you exalt Jesus in a way that's really not ideal? What if it's an obscure role? What if it's a frustrating one, a mundane one? What if it's one where no one ever knows or remembers your name on this planet? What if it's one that includes rejection or loss or great suffering, inconvenience, even persecution? The point is that true life begins when we lay our plans at the feet of our sovereign king and believe truly that his plans are far better and far more important than ours. And so second truth we see from John is true life and joy are found by treasuring and exalting Jesus. So look in verse 29. John the Baptist continues to contrast himself with Jesus by offering a parable to further explain the relationship. And it's a marriage illustration which connects back to a theme we encountered at Jesus' first sign that Jesus is the bridegroom. So in John 2, 1 through 11, Jesus changed the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. He provides the good wine. And we noted then that in doing so, he showed himself to be the true bridegroom and the true Messiah, the fulfillment of these prophetic expectations. This picks up on an Old Testament theme as God's people are often depicted as his bride. So Isaiah 62, Jeremiah 2, Hosea 2 would be some examples you could look at to see that theme. And that's developed in the New Testament and applied the bridegroom theme to Jesus. John the Baptist does it here. Paul does it in Ephesians 5, where the church is Christ's bride, whom he died to save and sanctify. And then the story of Scripture ends in Revelation with a portrait of a wedding to come. Christ's bride is fully prepared and presented for him, to be with him forever. And so verse 29, John draws on that idea, and he says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. So that's Jesus. The bride is his. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So that's John. He's the friend. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. So let's unpack this a little further. Start with that first part. John identifies Jesus as the bridegroom. Now that is a huge theological statement right out of the gate. Because in the Old Testament, it is the Lord who is the groom. God is the groom. Israel is his bride. 
And that title of bridegroom is being applied to Jesus here. It is a claim of deity. Also, John is explaining why it is such a good and beautiful thing that people are going to Jesus. It's because they're his. They're his bride. Those the Father has given to the Son to belong to him as part of his bride, as part of his people, part of his church, they are starting to go to him. And that's a good thing because the bride belongs with the bridegroom, not with the friend of the bridegroom. And that's how John identifies himself in the parable. He's the friend. And so in their culture, this would be the closest thing to what we have as like a best man. This close friend would help oversee the details of the wedding. Maybe you're like, that doesn't describe a best man (laughs) at all. They have no involvement in that, right? So these guys are even better. And they would help preside over it. And the number one goal of this friend of the bridegroom was to make sure that this day was all about the groom and the bride. His greatest joy is in seeing this wedding take place and then celebrating their union together. And you see that reflected, that deep love and joy in verse 29. John says, the friend stands by the groom, hears the groom, rejoices greatly at his voice, and therefore John can say, his joy is now complete. It's full. Because all he wants is to be in Jesus' presence and to see Jesus praised and glorified. And that's summed up in this maxim that he gives in verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Get that language of must. John is saying here, there is no other way. Because of who he is and who I am, this is what must happen. It is God's will. This is why I exist. And he's saying, I've played my part, and now I can rejoice. I can diminish. I can fade away. The bride is going to the groom, and praise the Lord for that. I have been uh, now a part of numerous weddings over the years. I've had the privilege of officiating um, several for close friends and family. I have served in the role of best man. And one of the things that I love watching at at any wedding ceremony is, uh, is just getting to watch the face of my friends, often the grooms, who have watched their brides walking down the aisle. It's a fun thing, especially when I'm officiating and I get to be like the closest one up there and see this as they they watch their bride come down the aisle. And you just, in that moment, you can't help but be overjoyed for them and with them. That it is a beautiful thing to delight in their delight. Your heart wants to explode. Why? Because you love them and you are rejoicing with them. And so it's a privilege to be able to get to present them as man and wife. And then really, this is my favorite part of the ceremony, is then I get to just fade into the background. <laughs> like it's over, they walk out, and then their love and their marriage is celebrated and, and praise the Lord. And that's John's role. He's the best man. He's, he's helping preside over this. And though his task was unique in some ways, there are also parallels to our mission and task. Just like John... We are in this kind of, uh, it's, it's a difficult role here to see completely that we're both part of Christ's bride, right? We are members of his church if we believe in Jesus, so we are among the bride, but we're also friends of the bridegroom, that we live to proclaim Jesus and point others to him and serve him by loving his bride, loving his church, and promoting her love for him. So I want to focus our attention on that last aspect and ask, how are we doing with that? What kind of friend of the bridegroom are you, are we? To help us think through this picture even more, think about some ways we could be really bad friends of the bridegroom. Probably could list a lot of them, (laughs) but I'll list two, and, and then we'll apply them at the church level. First, it would be completely inappropriate for the friend of the bridegroom to be jealous of the groom. (laughs) That's what some of John's disciples feel for him, jealousy. But he doesn't feel that at all. He feels joy. But just as we noted earlier, when we're glory seekers rather than glory givers, we can fall into this trap. We can desire to be the center of attention. We can long for the adoration that should only be given to the groom. Again, we're back in the Garden of Eden again. Like Adam and Eve, we can desire to be like God 
rather than to worship God and see him praised. Again, the problem is our pride. We are tempted to believe that true joy and happiness will be found in being exalted and being like God, being treasured by others rather than in treasuring Jesus and being treasured and loved by him. And second way, related, it would be completely inappropriate for the friend of the bridegroom to spend his time distracting the bride from the groom. When we want the attention on us and we're tempted to take actions then to make the bride, or we're talking here about the church, more focused on us than she is on the groom. When I'm conducting a wedding, I don't have too many rules, um, but if I find out that the best man or the groomsmen, the friends of the groom, intend to use the bride's entrance and approach to do something really dumb. <laughs> it's like, that's a no-no for me. Um, if you're going to use it as a chance to make a scene and to draw the attention on you, then we're going to have issues because you're not the point of the ceremony. This marriage is. And this can take on so many forms in the life of the church, right? Right? You just think about a consumer mentality. If we come to church as consumers and we try to make it about us or make it about our agenda, our preferences, our name, our recognition, whatever it is, we can do things that really do distract the bride from her love of the groom. We can redirect eyes towards us when her vision, our vision, is meant exclusively for the one who died to save us and sanctify us. And so here's the point of all this. Our love for the groom is expressed in how we love the bride, the church. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And in light of what John is saying, one of the ways we love one another the most is by working relentlessly to promote and deepen one another's affection for our bridegroom, for Jesus. The last thing we would ever want to do is detract from the worship of him, take, take one another's eyes off of him. So John provides a beautiful example for us to follow. He is the ultimate best man, the ultimate wingman, as he paves the way for Jesus. He praises and promotes Jesus. He gladly loses disciples as they go to Jesus. He points the bride to the bridegroom and then finds his joy in the bride loving and clinging to Jesus. That's why he existed, and that should be our aim as well, to see one another cling to Jesus and love him more. And final point, true life and joy are found by trusting and obeying Jesus. So in verses 31 through 36, it's difficult to know um, who is the, the speaker here. I mentioned last week, we don't have quotation marks uh, in, in the Greek here, so context has to determine where one speaker ends and another begins. So commentators are divided on whether this is still John the Baptist or whether this is John the Apostle, the author of the gospel. I think it's most likely John the author, who again is giving an extended commentary, but either way, good news, it's John, right? That's the sim simple form, just like, well, John, John's speaking, and so we'll just, we'll say that to avoid any confusion or maybe that's really confusing for you. Um, but it continues the theme of how Jesus is greater than John the Baptist. So after verse 30, you can almost hear an assumed question and response. Why? Why must John decrease and Jesus increase? And verses 31 and following are an answer to that question. And so a few points here. First thing we see is that Jesus is superior to John because he is above all. Verse 31, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. So, so key here. Everyone besides Jesus who speaks does so in earthly ways, finite ways. We are limited. So that was true of the, of the messengers before of John the Baptist, of John the Apostle, and of us, is that as finite creatures, our knowledge is limited. Our spiritual insight and wisdom is limited. 
our power is very limited. So John the Baptist, for example, can preach about repentance, and he can baptize with water, but he cannot cause new birth. (laughs) He cannot bring the spiritually dead to life. He cannot empower repentance and obedience. He cannot reveal truth directly from heaven as one who resides there. Only the one from above can do these things. And Jesus is the one because he comes from heaven and is above all, which means he has supreme authority and power. He can speak about heavenly things, eternal things, with complete faithfulness because he's the eternal son of God who came from heaven to reveal these things to us. And so that's the second thing we see here, that Jesus is superior to John because he is uniquely anointed by the Spirit to utter the very words of God. Verse 32, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. If you were here last week, this sounds very familiar with Jesus' evaluation in John 3.11. He, rece- he, he testifies to what he's seen and heard, but no one receives it. Verse 33, and whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that is, they certifies this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. I wish <laughs> we had more time to unpack the, the weightiness of, of this statement, right? But this is the idea. In in previous times, God would give his messengers the measure of the Spirit needed for the task at hand. Right? They'd be they'd have an anointing from the Spirit to speak what God had called them to speak. But this is different with Jesus. He receives a measureless anointing. Well, how much? (laughs) Measureless. (laughs) We can't, we can't fathom it. We can't wrap our minds around it. As much as there is of the Spirit of God, infinite, Jesus has that. It's mind-blowing stuff going on here. John the Baptist testified in chapter 1 that he saw the Spirit descend on Jesus, but not just that, remain on Jesus. And so this is the fil- fil- fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the Messiah, the Anointed One. And it explains verse 33. Whoever receives his testimony, that is the testimony of the Son, sets a seal to this, that God is true. Well, who, who, who is the person believing? Are they believing the Son or are they believing God? Yes. Right? Because to hear the Son is to hear the words of God. What he's saying is that the Son of God perfectly reveals the Father to us. John five nineteen. Jesus tells us that the Son does what the Father does and says what the Father says. So how you respond, friends, to Jesus' words is how you have responded to the God of the universe. To believe the Son's testimony is to believe God. To refuse to believe Jesus, to reject His testimony, is to reject God. John, in his letters goes so far in 1 John 5.10, he says this is the same as calling God a liar because we've refused his words about and through his son. It's serious. And then third, Jesus is superior to John because he is uniquely loved as the son of God. So verse 35, the father loves the son. You talk about something that... um, that words just really can't convey the depth of what's going on here. This theme permeates the gospel, and it's a statement that we're talking about unsearchable depths, a love that has existed fully and perfectly and eternally. We're talking about Trinitarian love, Father and Son forever. And this love is revealed in one, one way in the second part of the verse, and that the Father has given all things into his hand. Jesus says the same thing of himself in Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And the point is, again, that Jesus has all authority. He is above all. He's the preeminent one. And this is a broad and sweeping statement. All things. It's tough to get broader than that. Just everything. But in John's gospel alone, we're told of numerous things in particular that the Father 
has given over to the Son. So here's just a few examples. In John 5, 22, we're told that the Son has authority to judge. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. In John 6, 37 through 39, which we read a few moments ago, we see that the Father has given believers to Jesus as his possession to keep them, protect them, and resurrect them on the last day. In John 17, 2, Jesus prays to the Father who has given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom the Father gives him. So he has authority over everybody to grant eternal life to all who believe. Perhaps the most comprehensive statement in the Gospels is in Matthew 28, 18, when Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And we see the significance of that truth for us in the final verse of our passage today. Verse 36, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. Just take in, again, the heaviness, the significance of those words. Because Jesus has been granted, given all authority to give eternal life to those who believe in him, but also to judge all those who reject him, This verse shows us that our eternity hinges on how we respond to Jesus. Every human being exists in one of these two groups. First, you have those who believe in Jesus and they have eternal life. Not will have eternal life. They have it. We mentioned last week that when we hear eternal uh, life, we shouldn't just think about quantity of, of an endless number of days, but of quality of life. Eternal life, John 17, 3, is knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. Whoever believes in Jesus enjoys the reality of that life right now, that we know the Lord, and we will enjoy the fullness of that life for endless days in God's presence. That's eternal life, enjoying our God forever and ever and ever. But then the second group is described to us. Those who do not obey Jesus will not see life. Do you note how disobeying is the contrast of believing here? It's a key link. Faith and obedience go together. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So a a huge distinction here in the gospel. We're not saved by doing the commandments. We're not saved on the merits of our obedience. We're saved by believing in Jesus. But those who believe in Jesus love Jesus and desire to obey him. And John says that those who do not obey Jesus, who do not believe, who do not love him and submit to him, they have God's wrath remain on them. This goes back to the same thing we saw last week, that there is no state of neutrality with Jesus. John doesn't say that one day in the future, God's wrath will be directed at those who reject Jesus. He's saying that in our sin, we are already condemned. God's wrath is already on us in our rebellion because that is a righteous response to our rebellion against our Creator. But there's no neutral ground. Right now, every one of us, we either receive Jesus in faith or we reject Him and stand opposed to Him and under God's judgment for not believing. And so there are no higher stakes in life than this decision. And so a few questions for you to consider in our time of response today. The first, have you embraced Jesus in faith? What is your relationship to God today, friends? Did you have one? It's just, is it a a right one? Or is it one where there's separation? What's the status of the relationship? Do you believe in the Son who is loved by the Father and who loves you with an unfathomable love? Or do you reject Him? Do you refuse Him? Do you want to do it your way 
and stand under God's judgment. And the good news for us today, friends, is that a right relationship with God is not achieved by working harder, by doing religious deeds, by cleaning ourselves up. This is the simple call from the passage. How do we receive this life? Believe in the Son. Believe in the Son. Believe in the one who lived perfectly in your place, who died as an atoning sacrifice for your sin, and who rose from the grave and lives now to reconcile you to God and to intercede for you, to give you a right standing with God. Believe in him. And for those who do believe, second question, are you living for Jesus' exaltation? So going back to that earlier, some of the earlier questions, in what ways are you drifting towards the lie right now that true life and joy will be found when you're on the throne? when you're in control. And will you ask God just to to help you in this time to submit again to him, to trust him with your life, to treasure Jesus above all else, and that he would help us make John's words our life's purpose. He must increase. I must decrease. Let's pray and ask God that he would do that in our hearts and in our midst. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for sending your son to reveal who you are, to reveal your love for us, to reveal the way that we can receive eternal life and be with you forever. We thank you that the work is finished, that the way has been secured, that the payment for our sin has been taken care of at the cross. And I, I would ask that anyone here, anyone listening with us who have, has not embraced Jesus in faith, submitted to him as Lord and King, trusting in him for their salvation, that you would call them to yourself today. That you would draw them to yourself by your spirit so that they would believe in Jesus and bend a knee in worship of him. And Father, for those who have believed, how quick we can believe the lie again and again that we're only going to be happy. We're only going to find joy in doing things according to our own ways and our own wisdom. And would you just convict us of that, lead us to repentance, and bring us back to this place of trust in your goodness and your sovereignty and your care for us as your beloved bride. And so we ask that you would do these things in our hearts, in this body today, all for the magnification of Jesus' name. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.